I'm so excited that this week we continue on to speak about the book of Proverbs. And we've entitled this sermon or this series, Moving In. I don't know about you, but have you noticed that when you travel, you get to know yourself? Right? Actual fact, when you travel, you get to know the people that travel with you. If you think you've got friends, go on vacation with them, right? It is only when you really go on vacation with them that you figure out who these people are. And uh, it's quite interesting. I've been traveling for the last, well, not this week, but last week quite a fair bit. And um, I got to know myself a little bit better. And when pastor asked me to preach this particular sermon, um, I don't know, for you that preach, you will quickly figure out that sometimes, right, just sometimes, you preach your sermon just for yourself, yes. And uh, I made so many mistakes in this particular area in the last two weeks. So this morning as I preach, I'll be doing public confession as we go along. And when you hear me do a public confession, that's the time to say, uh, that's the time that you pray. And you say, oh, Jesus, have mercy on him. Uh, help him <laughs> as he continues. So, uh, last week, in actual fact, it's exactly a week ago that I arrived back from Taiwan where I spent about a week in ministry there. And if any of you have ever traveled to Asia, you'll know that the jet lag can be extraordinary, right? 12 hours difference. And uh, it is Sunday morning. I've returned back from Asia and I'm at JFK Airport. Has anybody ever been to JFK Airport? I wonder if it might be the incarnation of hell. I'm not entirely sure, right? And, <laughs> and I'm standing in line, and I'm confused, and I'm tired, and the line just gets longer and longer and longer to get through, of course, um, security. And, and there must have been a tip-off because there were police and dogs sniffing all kinds of people, and I'm standing there and I'm saying, oh, Jesus, catch them. Every one of them. Uh, maybe not the right prayer. <laughs> maybe I should have prayed for mercy. Anyways, and I'm standing there and there's a couple standing right in front of me. And they are commenting. Of course, they're speaking in a different language than English. And they're commenting on um, how terrible the people are around them, right? And they're starting to say, well, how big is that one? And I'm like, that one's nose. And what in the world is that one wearing? And um, except the language they spoke is my mother tongue, right? Yes. <laughs> and so they stood right in front of me. And I, I let them go for a little bit, you know, just to see where this would go. And uh, at some point, I just kind of leaned in and I whispered to them and I say, what are you saying? <laughs> in, in my mother tongue. And they kind of had a, had a bit of a shock. And I said, you never know who is listening. Well, <clears throat> they responded in quite an uncharitable way <laughs> and shared with me some words that I haven't heard for a very, very long time. Words that you cannot find in a dictionary. Uh, but as a pastor, those kind of things doesn't worry me. They energize me, right? <laughs> they get me going. And so I continued on the conversation. And before they knew it, of course, the wonderful thing about being in line is that nobody can escape. Right? <laughs> and at that point in time, I was able to share the gospel a little bit with them. And we had a good conversation in the end. We, we, we parted as somewhat friends. will not call us complete friends, but maybe the beginning of a blossoming friendship might indeed be there. So it's in that context that I want to say to you, we need to watch the words that we say because God watches us at all times. And so this morning, for a few moments, I want to speak to you about the power of the tongue. We are looking at the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is an extraordinary text in the Old Testament, and it's a collection of sayings, sayings of wisdom, sayings of, of, of not only wisdom, but what does it mean to live a holy life, a new standard of holiness. If you brought your Bibles, our key scripture comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 18, and we're going to read from verse 20. And it says, from the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach 
is satisfied. He is satisfied by the yield of his lips. I can say a whole bunch about this text, but may I just quickly say in essence what this text is saying is that we live by what we say. Uh, Our words shape the very life that we live. It goes on and it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruits. If I had to retranslate it, I would say, watch the words you say, because you might have to eat it later. Right? <laughs> Jesus said something very similar. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, Jesus made this statement. He said, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. That word careless is an interesting word. In Greek, actually, it's the word lazy. A lazy word. And I thought about all the careless things I have said over the last 50 years or so. Jesus then goes on. He says that you will give an account for it. He says, for by your words, you'll be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. Church, I I so pray you will not stand behind me that day when I'm standing before the throne of Christ and will have to give an account for every lazy word. To be very honest with you, you're going to stand in line for a long time. But I've practiced what I'm going to (laughs) say. When I get there in front of Jesus, I'm just going to shout out, I trust in the blood of Jesus. (laughs) Uh, I might even say in Latin, Kyrie eleison, Lord, have mercy on me. Indeed. One of the early church fathers speaks of this, a man called John Chrysostom. And John Chrysostom is one of my favorite people in all the world. Um, John's second name, Chrysostom, is not his last name, but a nickname. And Chrysostom literally means he that's got a golden mouth. And John was known for his extraordinary preaching, but he was also known as a man of holiness and a man that carefully weighed his words. And one of his sermons He writes, God has surrounded the tongue with a double wall, a barrier of teeth and the fence of the lips, in order that it may not easily and heedlessly utter words it should not speak. Keep it curbed within your mouth. Actual fact, (laughs) I love this this statement. Uh, In the sermon he goes and he says, and if your tongue offends you, bite it. Um, I thought I would remove that from the sermon, but of course, it slipped through. So this morning, for a few moments, I want us to look at the book of Proverbs. And I do want to tell you, when Pastor asked me to preach on this, um, I will say to you that it was quite a difficult decision on what what to keep out and what to put in. The book of Proverbs has got so much to say about the way that we utilize our words. If we wanted to go through the book of Proverbs and look at everything it said about correct and holy speech, church, we will be here until every cow comes home, right? Uh, It will take us a very long time. But this morning, very quickly, I want to share with you five great truths from the book of Proverbs that speaks about the right use of words. Number one. Proverbs says that words can cause real damage. We're going to come back to this in a moment. Words also can bring healing. They can bring peace. They can edify. And lastly, I'm going to share with you what the Bible says about how do we sift our words. Let me start with that first one just for a moment. Church, words can cause real damage. You all remember that schoolyard taunt, haven't you? Uh, Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words, right, will never hurt me. I think that's what it says, right? I'm still learning your American sayings. Um, Help me with that. In time, I will become better. But listen to what the Scripture declares. In Proverbs 25, verse 18, it says, A man who bears false witness against his neighbor. Uh, The Hebrew is a little bit more precise. The Hebrew says, a man who utters falsehoods, 
who says things that are not true. What is he like? The text says he's like a war club or a sword or a sharp arrow. Church, words can cause real damage. I've done my fair bit of pastoral counseling, and I will tell you, more often than not, people carry deep wounds within their hearts about something that was said to them. Maybe there was a careless word being spoken where somebody would say, I hate you, or I reject you, or you're a failure, you're a loser, never wanted you, right? And sometimes those words can carry over in our lives, and we tend to carry those words deep within our hearts, and we sometimes even rehearse them over and over and over again. The truth be told, that these words actually do cause extraordinary damage. Listen to what the Apostle James writes about the tongue. James 3 verse 6. James says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell itself. Church, every divorce starts with a word. Every breaking of a friendship starts with a word. Every war in this world starts with a word. And so words can cause real and lasting damage. Basil the Great, another great church father, writes, the most common and multifaceted sin is the one enacted by the tongue. Most of our sin starts with something that we say. But church, not only can words cause extraordinary damage, words can bring healing. The words that God speaks to us has the power not only to heal us, but to recreate our lives. Proverbs 15 verse 4 says, a gentle tongue is a tree of life. I love this. It doesn't only say that it brings life, but it says it is a tree that can continue to bring life and bear fruit forever. It is the source of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Paul writes in his letter to the Colossian church, he says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to you ought to answer each person. When the Apostle Paul says that it must be seasoned with salt, salt in the New Testament is always a symbol of healing. And the question that we need to ask is, have we chosen our words careful so that they might indeed bring healing? Well, church, how do we get to that place? How do we get to that place where indeed we have become so aware of what we say that we choose words that can bring healing? One of the early church fathers, a man called John Climaxus, writes, he says, he who has become aware of his sins has controlled his tongue. He who has become aware of his sins has controlled his his tongue. About five years ago, I had a significant encounter with the Holy Spirit on this stage. For the ones that preach, let me say to you, ever so often, when you preach, the Holy Spirit will arrest you. It is a very difficult experience because you try to keep your composure, right, and not totally come apart at the seams while God is sorting you out. And let me just share with you the context. About 18 years or so ago, a very good friend of mine stole something from me. He stole a text. And he took that text and published it under his own name. Yes. It happened not just once, but it happened twice. And I thought, he thought I would never find out. But of course, I did. And I'm going to say to you, I felt so betrayed. I was so angry. And, and you don't know me that well, but let me just say to you that I am gifted when it comes to being sharp with my tongue. 
Uh, yes, I'll save you lots of things I said. And, uh, and I remember I confronted him. He didn't have much to say. This is, I think, what he said. He said, well, we brothers, what's yours is mine. Yes. And this is what I said. It was very short. But probably one of the crudest things I've ever said. I said, I'll see you on the other side. And what this really meant is, I've had enough of you. I'm done. I'm not going to see you in this life ever again. If I get to heaven, and if you make it, not sure about it right now, but if you make it, I will look for you on the other side. Can you think of anything more cruel? And I was settled in my heart that I was done with this person. And of course, I'm here Sunday morning preaching, and pastor asked me to preach on the Lord's Prayer. Well, seemed innocent enough. And I'm preaching away, and of course, I'm reading that beautiful section. It says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those that have sinned against us. And church, I'm reading that text, and of course, I've read it many times. I've prayed it many, many, many thousands of times, and as I'm reading it, the Lord just put his finger right on my heart and he says, okay, now the time has come, right? You are guilty as sin. Well, it meant that the next time that I went to South Africa, I had to go and meet with this brother and buy him lunch and uh, repent to him and said, I am so sorry for what I said. I am so sorry for everything that I did. In essence, what I said to you is worse than, worse than probably the fact that you stole something from me. And uh, we were reconciled. And I'm even open to meet with him one more time. And <laughs> wait, we'll see. No, 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 no. Not just one more time. I'll meet wherever the Lord needs me to meet with him. No, nope. whenever I see him, I will meet with him. And indeed, embrace him. God is just bringing some, some healing uh, right there as we go. But folks, sometimes we don't realize the kind of things that we can say. John Climax says, but he who has become aware of his sins has controlled his tongue. Church, what if God had to treat us the way we treat others? Where would we be? Right? At what point would we be able to survive? John goes on, he says, but a talkative person <laughs> has not yet come to know himself as he should. What John really is speaking about is the person that's got a flippant tongue. Thirdly, church, words can bring peace. Listen to what Proverbs says. A soft answer turns away wrath. Well, was it yesterday maybe? I cannot think about it. Yes. No, it was probably Friday. Yes. Friday, <laughs> I committed another sin. And so let me tell you about it. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been in that situation. So one of the things that happens when you're jet lagged, uh, your heart is present, but your body and your mind might not be, right? And all of your natural rhythms are completely and totally off. And um, I remember on Friday, I said to my family, I am starving. Have, have you ever been at that moment where you are absolutely and totally convinced if you don't get food right now, you will die? And not only was I starving, but I had a hankering, right? Uh, at that point in time, I've, yeah, I've, I've eaten so much Asian food, and I love Asian food. But <clears throat> I needed some real food, right? Uh, <clears throat> I needed a burger. Ever been there, right? And I heard that the Shake Shack just opened in Virginia Beach. Ever been there? And by this time, I am waiting and waiting and waiting for my family to come, and I'm cranky. Because don't they understand if we don't get to this place right now, burgers will not eat themselves and I will die any second. We get there, it is chaos, there are so many people there, it takes us a while to order, I finally get everything ordered, but now there's no place to sit. And so I go and I stand there watching, you know, all the tables like hawks. If anybody gets up, I'm going to be the first person to be there. And um, I'm slightly irritated because I cannot get my family to come and stand with me and watch. And we are, ab I I'm about to die. Don't they understand how urgent this is? When the food comes, I need to eat immediately because I will not make it. 
And there's a couple that stood behind me in line watching. <laughs> and I overhear them say, and the table opened, and the gentleman says, oh, there's the table, let's just go. Of course, they're cutting the line. And I turned around, and my gift for having a sharp tongue came out. And I just said, well, why don't you go first, right? And immediately when I turned around, I realized, okay, I might be in trouble. Uh, this is one of those very big marine kind of guys, you know, <laughs> all bowled out, and he didn't look very friendly. And I was so humbled because this gentle creature, and as I said last night, he, he might be in church this morning. I hope not. And um, he kind of, this is what he said to me. He says, oh, bro, don't worry. He says, you can come and sit with me. C come, come, you can come and sit. And immediately I was reminded of this text, right? I already prepared this sermon. <laughs> and so <laughs> a soft answer turns away, uh, turns away wrath. And of course, what he did is that immediately he soft, gentle, accommodating spirit, right? Just de-escalated all the tension immediately. And so finally I went and sat, and of course throughout the whole meal I just felt absolutely terrible, like a pagan. Well, I first ate and then I felt terrible. And, uh, <clears throat> right there, and I'm thinking, oh, what a pagan I am. And so right at the end I walked up to him, and I just very quickly say to him, are you okay? And he says, oh, bro, I've got you. Um, how difficult that can be, right? But a soft answer. Words can bring peace. It goes on, it says, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouth of fools pour out folly. I've been there. I've been there so many times. Listen to what the Apostle Paul writes in his letter to the Philippian church. He says, finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's commendable, if there's anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Isn't it funny the moment that you meet with somebody and they get slightly irritated or angry with you, that so often we think they flex their muscles and we flex it back? And the scripture says, whenever we meet with people, whenever we think anything, let's think about the best. The Apostle Paul wrote in another letter, and he says, love believes the best. We need to get to that place where indeed we believe the very best of people. A contemporary Greek Orthodox author, Hilarion, writes the following. He says, if you feel that hatred has overwhelmed you, remain silent. By ceaseless prayer and self-examination, you have calmed your heart. That's indeed how we do it. Church words can also edify. Not only edify the people that surround us, but edify our very hearts. It's interesting that whenever we say something ugly to somebody in order to injure them, we forget that we are the first ones to be injured by our own words. Listen to what Proverbs says. Proverbs 11 says, a man who is kind benefits himself. Literally, the Hebrew text says, when a man speaks kind words, he benefits himself, but a cruel man hurts himself. Well, church, how do we get to that place that we carefully sift our words, carefully think about the words that we speak? Well, church, we meditate on God's word. We speak God's word. Psalms 119 says, With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up in my, your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The Philokalia collection of writings from the 4th century writes the following. Reading the scriptures is a great safeguard against sin. The more we read the scriptures, the more we, we hide the scriptures within our hearts, the more we meditate within the scriptures, the more the Lord will help us to say the right thing at the right time. And church, lastly this morning, number five, how do we sift our words? 
How do we get to that place where we go before the Lord and we say, okay, God, take a hold of my heart, take a hold of my mind, take a hold of my tongue. Church, the discipline of knowing when to speak and when not to speak. The discipline, the great discipline of silence. Silence sifts our words. Proverbs 11 verse 12 writes the following. Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense. <laughs> how often, how often when we tease somebody or when we joke with somebody, it carries with it that belittlement, making somebody smaller. Folks, I've not said this publicly, but let me go ahead and say that my family and I recently became American citizens, and we've been so grateful for the generosity and the openness and um, the great hospitality of this great nation. And we love, or at least I love all things American, except your news channels. Well, now our news channels. Let me own our sin, right? I watch our news channels and... I, I cannot believe the way we talk about one another. Church, we're about to enter a new election cycle. And may I just say to you, we are going to do better this time. Amen. We are going to watch our words. And we'll be careful when we say things to make sure, number one, they're true. Secondly, that it's charitable. And thirdly, remembering that there are real people out there that we are saying things about. We're going to watch ourselves on Facebook. We're going to watch ourselves at the water cooler at work. We're going to watch ourselves whatever we say. Because we recognize that we want to imitate Christ himself. What an extraordinary step this is. But Proverbs 11 says, whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense. But a man of understanding remains silent. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. Psalms 141 says, the set a God, O Lord, over my mouth. Church, how often I have bitten that God to death. With the things that I have said. It says keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not let my heart incline to any evil. To busy myself with wicked deeds. In company with men who work iniquity. And let me not eat of their delicacies. An early church father by the name of Ephraim. Actually not early, it's contemporary, sorry. This guy, this chap is still alive. And he writes. I read a book about two years ago extraordinary book on the discipline of silence that this chap wrote and he says when one keeps silence he is given time and freedom for prayer and interior gathering gathering yourself together when however he passes his hours heedlessly he does not have time for prayer and from his heedless speech he also derives different sins church we are now at a place where I believe God is calling us as a body to lift up the standard of holiness in our midst. And one way that we do this is by watching the words that we speak. The words that we speak can do real damage, but they can also bring healing, and they can bring peace, and they can edify. Let us learn the wisdom of when to speak and when not to speak. Everything worthwhile that God said is in one book. To be quite honest with you, I think whatever nonsense I've said over the last month is probably more than this book all put together. We have to get to the place of watching every word that we speak, knowing that indeed our words carry with them life or death. So this morning, we're going to spend time in communion just in a few moments. But what a great opportunity for us to reflect and go before the Lord and say, Lord, would you come and cleanse my tongue? Would you come and cleanse my lips? 
There's a beautiful text in the Old Testament where the prophet Isaiah, I don't know if you remember, saw the Lord high and lifted up in the year that his king died. And as he saw God and he saw all of his glory, remember what he said. He says, woe is me because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell amongst people of unclean lips. And remember, an angel came and took a coal from the altar and touched his lips and said, now you are clean. Church, this morning, we are going to cry out to God during this time. And in a moment, our pastors are going to come up and lead us into communion. And as we do this, church, may I just say to you, this is the right and perfect opportunity as we partake of the bread and the wine to say to the Lord, Lord, would you come and cleanse my lips and may my lips be used as instruments of life and healing and edification. May my words show the glory of God. May they be clean and pure. Let us pray together. Father, this morning we come before you in the glorious and holy name of Christ himself through the power of your spirit. And Lord, this morning as we look into the mirror of your word, we see many areas that need to be changed. Would you come this morning? Would you get a hold of our hearts? Would you gather us inside? And Lord, would you take a call from your holy altar and touch our lips and would you cleanse it so that every word that we speak might be pure and holy and bring healing and edification and life and peace now and forever. We pray this in the glorious and holy name of Jesus. Amen.